Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Manson Saga discussion panel with me, Paul. Over there is Danny After Dark, and we are joined again by Nicholas Streck. He did, in fact, come back. Yes. Well, af after a little private conversation and the arrangement we made, uh, I think yeah, the yeah. conditions are satisfactory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. You know, you know right. what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man i'll never snitch uh <laughs> that's what so, they all say <laughs> right all right danny do you want to just dive right into her yeah so in in chapter five the outlaw you quoted gail zappa and michael walker's uh, moral canyon uh it's a quote if you were surprised by the manson murders you weren't connected to what was going on on the canyon period mm -hmm. um can you explain that quote and why gail zappa made that statement well i don't know exactly but i can tell you i talked to gail zappa and she confirmed that she had met charlie at the whiskey a go go when she was the booking agent at the whiskey a go go before she married frank zappa and uh, she worked with mario maglieri and elmer valentine who were these mobsters that own the whiskey a go go and so she met him early on, you know, and as a character on the music scene. And then later he got involved with Frank Zappa musically, we went over there and jammed with Frank Zappa. She also knew Bobby Beausoleil and independently. A lot of people right. knew Beausoleil and Charlie separately as two different characters in the Hollywood music scene. Um, right. But Gail, Gail Zappa, you know, she said that, there were so many of these entourages, including her own, include, including the group around Frank Zappa. There were all these little entourages around charismatic men, for the most part, all of right. them with their, you know, ideology and their, their message. And there were so many of them. And then, of course, there was drug dealing and big money being exchanged. So nobody was surprised by what happened. None right. of those I think people, that's big. None, none of... No, you know, uh, the way that it's presented to the general public by the official narrative is people were so hard, celebrities were horrified that maybe they're going after celebrities. No, the people in Beverly Hills and Bel Air and all over L.A. who were involved in the narcotics trafficking were terrified that a whole bunch of drug dealers were killed. Right. Yeah. Gary, and I think that's I really mean, people already knew. You have to remember these people knew who Bernard Crow was. Terry Melcher right. and Dennis Wilson and Greg Jacobson knew who he was. Mama Cass knew who he was. So, okay, this guy is shot. Gary Hinman, Dennis Wilson had dealings with. He's dead. Mm -hmm. So this is a chain of fear coming. And then Sebring and Furkowski, where everyone in the Hollywood scene knows what is happening at Cielo Drive. It's, it's not even a secret. You know, it's right. a joke to pretend it's a secret. Everyone knows what's happening. They're dead. Of course, people are terrified that they are the people who have burnt people, the people involved in drug deals. They were terrified. That's And that's why Polanski's friend, Richard Silbert, the art designer for Rosemary's Baby, made this famous statement to Newsweek. Uh, Toilets were flushing all over Beverly Hills. Now... If they, that was said in August, a few days after the murders, why would a close friend of Roman Polanski say that if he doesn't know exactly what it's about? Right. There, right. you know, among those people, it wasn't a mystery what happened. It was a mystery maybe who did it because there were so many culprits, and because right. Wojtek Frakowski was such an asshole, so many people hated him, <laughs> and Sebring was so much in debt was such a loud mouth and a gossip there were plenty of people who had and had all these mob connections to sinatra and others it's more a guessing game who did it but not why right and and it's interesting that you mentioned um about uh, the toilets flushing everywhere because we listened to you mentioned in your book about amos russell Mm -hmm. the, the, butler. the butler, the butler for Jay Sebring. Yeah. The butler for Jay he Sebring. Wasn't he was, he called himself a butler, but he was a, he did everything. He was a handyman. He was his social secretary. He did everything. He, he was a jack of all 
trades, but he called right. himself and Butler. So he says that two women came. Because one, one, one point, yeah. Winifred Chapman also mm -hmm. was the maid for Sebring. So there okay. were other people there. You know, the, they shared the Polanski's maid also went over to Sebring's to clean up. Oh. So, yeah. Okay. So, That's so Amos Russell was, anyway, he was his valet, his everything. Right. And he says in his, when he's being interviewed by the police, that two women came by. Now, in your book, you, you name one of the women that he didn't know the name of. Mm -hmm. And the other one was, he says, Miss Charlene, who we're assuming is Charlene McCaffrey. She is Charlene McCaffrey, yeah. who is, for people who may not know, the receptionist at Sebring International, but more importantly, the girlfriend of Joel Rostow, one of the major drug dealers to the stars who had been robbed in a home invasion, exactly like what happened at Cielo Drive in April, April 15th, I believe. I'm not sure of the date. I think it was April 15th. I'm right. sure someone will correct me if I'm ever wrong. Um, <laughs> okay. I think they're so friendly in that way um, <laughs> that Joel Rostow and her were at his apartment and they were robbed of their drugs. Someone came in with a gun, two men, and robbed them of the drugs. Well, right. that was Tex. And Tex was already robbing people's drugs. And what did he do with that? He tied their hands together. He said, where's the stuff? He, ran, he took the drugs and he acted. And this is typical of the whole chaos of this whole criminal constellation. He mm -hmm. ended up shooting Rostow in the foot and the neighbors heard it and Tex and whoever he was with, I don't know. And actually this was one of the points Charlie corrected. I had written in the 2011 based on erroneous information that I corrected that it was Bruce Davis who went with Tex to do that. Charlie, okay. interest, now Charlie, when I asked him in 2008 about the, this Rostow robbery, I said to him, are you telling me Tex didn't say to you, we robbed this mob guy and he's probably going to be angry at us? <laughs> and Charlie, I quote this in the book, two times in his life, he did this weird, very formal way of talking in like another voice, like he was possessed by a lawyer. He said, I am not obliged to talk about this at, that at this time, like, like <laughs> some like some consigliere whispered it in his ear on, to me that said, yeah, of course I did. Right. Um, but he didn't want to talk, but he then later said it wasn't Bruce Davis. So right. you don't know about it, but you know who it wasn't. And I've, so had how quite did... a, I've had quite a few conversations like that. I don't know anything about that, except it was a blue Toyota. It wasn't a, a green Volvo. Yeah. You know? so, um, <laughs> Yeah. So that was a giveaway that, of course, he did know. So he said that wasn't Bruce Davis. It turned out to be true. It couldn't have been because he was in England at that time. So, okay. So now Charlene McCaffrey and mm -hmm. Rostow were robbed. And right. She knew how did all you find out it was Tex? Sorry to interrupt, but I was curious how the information came out that it was Tex that robbed them. Susan Atkins told another person that she was in prison that these robberies had gone on long before. Okay. And, and then another source who I can't reveal also said that te they knew that Tex was robbing people going back to 1968, like a right. year before the crimes. So interesting. In yeah. Sorry. I was going to just say, yeah, we were, we were going to get into um, Tex's history of robbing, uh, robbing, well, Robbie. Robert. And well, yeah. the thing, the important thing there is Charlie, said always that the reason Tex came, he met him at Dennis Wilson's and then they hadn't seen each other for a while. And then he contacted him and came to the ranch with Dean Morehouse. And Charlie specifically said, I don't know what this is, that he had robbed a prostitute and that he had been involved in a drug burn where he had robbed a drug dealer and he was hiding out. That's why he went to the Spawn Ranch. And Charlie said that he, in, in retrospect, he, he let him move into the ranch 
for the trade of a 1935 truck that Charlie liked. Right. And uh, and Charlie said he reg- in retrospect he regretted for he just wanted the truck. He didn't like Tex particularly. He didn't even right. want him to be involved with the group because he did not trust him and said this was someone known for ripping people off and drug burns. Right. You know. So you no know, wonder so, so, down a bunch. So of this heat. is what this was what Tex Watson's MO was was robbing drug dealers and as Susan Atkins says tellingly in her Myth of Helter Skelter book if you rob a, why does she say it? But she does in her book. If you rob a drug dealer, they're not going to call the cops or the Better Business Bureau. Right. Uh, and that this was right. Texas M.O. from the beginning, from the very beginning. So, right. yeah, so Charlene McCaffrey went back to Sebring's under Steve McQueen's supervision. Steve McQueen, who is one of Jay Sebring's best friends, did not, as far as I know, I could be proven wrong tomorrow. There could be a photograph of him in Sebring's house, I don't know, supposedly drove up and down the street supervising people going in to take to get stuff out of Sebring's house before the cops came. And McQueen knew about the murders before the cops did. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking what, what sparked my, uh, my memory about that question in particular was talking about the uh, toilets flushing all over LA and everyone mm-hmm. getting stoned. Uh, Amos Russell had said that he didn't notice, and it could just be him saying it, but he said that he didn't notice anybody taking anything out of the house. Do you think it was just a disposal run? So they would have not been under, who, I, who I knows? Don't know. I, I, I don't like to speculate, you know. I mean, right. Amos Russell did, I heard Charlene McCaffrey was one of the people sent. She was mm-hmm. deeply connected to the drug dealing and the narcotics through Joel Rostow. What right. other reason would there be to go there, to quickly go in? Amos Russell said she was kind of nervous-like, mm-hmm. you know. And of course, I think Amos Russell's, to a certain degree, is also protecting the reputation of his employer. Sure, um, sure. And it's, but he it... knew, he, he heard that, you see, this was a reason, as I point out in the book, he was not used as a witness. Julio C. didn't call on him to tell us about the people who came over to clear out Sebring's house. And no. who did who told Amos Russell something happened to Mr. J? We don't know, but he knew it well before the cops. Right. You know. He, uh, yeah, it's that's one of those ones where it's total missed opportunity for any sort of. Truth and then, and, and I do that. know who the other woman was. I have discovered who she was, as I explained in the 2011 edition. I knew her first name, but I spelled it wrong. And once I got the spelling right, then I figured out exactly who it was, a young woman who lived with Tate and Polanski at Cielo Drive, a young Polish actress who was under, let's say euphemistically, under Roman's wing, uh, you know, okay. as he, gui- as he so guided her. Yeah, so to speak, as he guided her in her Hollywood career. I bet and she's did. mentioned in the Earl Deemer interview with him, and it's clear that Deemer knows something about that. There's a lot of questions Deemer asks. If you know what really happened, it's clear he's probing Polanski about issues. Uh, I'm digressing a bit, but for instance, Polanski pretends he never met uh, Vitold K. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact, Gene Gutowski told me he met him the night before, and when he got to L.A., that Vitold K is who panicky and anxiety ridden told them this was a drug deal. Wojtek was dealing drugs. People came over to the house. He called me. This is what you have to know. So right. Deemer is pushing Polanski and, he, and Polanski lies to him in this interview. He says, I never met him. I've heard about him, I, but he did meet him. And he mm-hmm. even came to Paramount for this meeting that was held uh, in Paramount in Julie Andrews' dressing room. So you know, Deemer clearly knew who this other woman was. And I did not mention her name because she's very prominent and very wealthy now. But you can figure it out if you want to. If you put two and two, you easily can figure out who she is. Right. Okay. I'm going to um I'm gonna kind of switch gears quick because uh in the last one I didn't get to ask you a couple questions I wanted to about the book itself. Yeah. Um, now I've gotten, luckily enough, thank you very much. You you, um, you forwarded us one of the the Manson file 
um, the pre the pre uh, right, book. and it's put together like just like because I'm a I'm a fan of your music and I like the. I like the way you put stuff together. It all feels very intentional. And with the way that this is put together, you've said before that this is a book about Manson and everything surrounding him. Mm -hmm. And so you broke it up into different chapters. The um, chapter zero is my life with the thrill kill cult. Then the philosopher, the minstrel, the wizard, the Beverly hillbilly, the outlaw, um, the revolutionary, and the soul for sale. Can you talk a bit about the importance of how you put this together and what these different factions, these different chapters, how they represent the man himself? Mm -hmm. Well, people who have read the 2011 edition will realize this is the same exact chapter order as was there. One major chunk that I added and in a way, it was an advantage that we stopped printing it in 2014 after Charlie came to me with all these revisions and corrections. And I realized to my horror that I had to keep doing this. Um, right. I added, because everyone asks about it, what was the first chapter, my life with the thrill, or zero, chapter zero, mm -hmm. my life with the thrill kill cult is specifically answering the two questions I'm asked most. What was Charlie like? And I for the and in the other editions I got into it, but this is more of a personal explanation of my. I think it's very important that people know before they even read all this who is the person that I know. I didn't know right. this cult leader that most people think they know. I didn't know right. that person because he doesn't exist. So right. I think it was very important to set in context. This is this complicated human being that I knew. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, this person who did these things was this person, not the person you may think he was. So that was important. And then secondly, how did I get into it is the question people ask me every single day. What, you know? And as I said in the book, kind of with the same tone that you ask a lunatic, like, when did this begin? You know, when they're yeah. laying on the couch. <laughs> and yeah. um, so I answer those questions in great detail and get into a bit bi more biographically how I was drawn into it, these bizarre connections to the case, and mm -hmm. how, uh, as I said, I fell down the rabbit hole of this thing when I was very young. So that is that is all completely new material, uh, the chapter zero. And then the other chapters, the, the way I designed the book was... Of course, of course, the crimes are brought up immediately in the preface, but I have right. to accentuate to anyone interested, don't get this book if you think it's a true crime book, because you will be bored out of your mind reading about Manson's music in detail, about his philosophy, about his political ideas, about his ecological ideas, uh, about, you know, everything about the entire person, because right. to me... It, you know, there is nothing intrinsically interesting about these crimes. They are exactly like the Wonderland murders. They're just another grubby... I mean, they're mysterious because they've been so covered up. What is interesting about them is the degree of powerful people who have spent decades concealing what happened right. uh, and not doing a very good job of it. You know, not, not, it's not a masterful conspiracy it's a bunch of different people protecting their ass for different vested interests but not all working together and sometimes working against each other as i point out in the book it wasn't this grand illuminati conspiracy it's actually pretty flimsy and if you take a little time you can quickly look through the lies so right uh so it's not i i want to you know caveat emptor this is not a true crime book and if you just want to go over forensic evidence of stab wounds, I don't do that. That's this is about this is about this person I got to know because I said, "Do you want to put out this record?" And I got mm -hmm. to know him, and it led to this. It snowballed into this. Um, so kind of turned into the the real Manson in his own words. Well, that There's was that. Of, yeah. yeah. Well, that as as I've said before, Charlie originally I wouldn't have even written the, the first book, the first edition. I was putting together a book about his philosophy. And as I mentioned in this book, after 
the 1988 edition came out and did very well. And he really liked it and tried to get it other prisoners, which is a sign of how much he liked it because he didn't take normal civilians were not even human to him. Prisoners and the underworld were the people he respected. And so right. he wanted to get it. But then I mentioned in the book that he had an idea to do a follow-up called The Mind of Manson. And he had a very specific, I describe it, a way he wanted the cover to be and what it would be. And a lot of that that we worked on but didn't do became The Wizard, which is a chapter about his spiritual influences, practices, philosophy, and uh, ev everything to do with his metaphysical beliefs, which to me along with his music, is by far the most important thing about him. The least important right. thing about him to me is that he was an accessory to this rather squalid uh, drug deal series of murders right. that his friends got involved with. You know, And in no way do I mitigate his guilt. You've read it. Is there yeah. any point at which I say he's innocent? or No. That's a, and that's a big, that's a huge... Um, misnomer for this for this whole thing is that i mean you you put in here everything there's you put in here that yeah he was he's culpable for it of course he was he was a criminal and but you don't just leave it at that which i think is is interesting and one uh one thing just kind of a random question to do with uh, i believe it's the wizard chapter you talk about him being him being like a shaman and you've called this myth and reality of an outlaw shaman, but I didn't realize quite what a shaman was and how there was sort of a, a criminality to that as well, or sort of an underworld bit to being a shaman. Can you uh, briefly explain that? Yeah, Just well, there can be, I mean, the new age movement has kind of misinterpreted and romanticized a shaman. But uh, when I went to Mexico myself in search of them when I was very young and looking for psychedelic drugs directly from shamanic traditions rather than mm -hmm. the Western way of doing it, um, there were shamans who had spiritual abilities and wisdom uh, who I say in the book would cut your throat for 15 pesos. Right. They had wisdom. And in tribal cultures all around the world, shaman actually the word comes from a Siberian root word, but because of uh, anthropologists like Mircea Eliadi, who studied shamanism, the word has come to be used universally for the witch doctor, the curandero, the, the tribal spiritual guide. But mm -hmm. shaman is actually, uh, uh, it's from Siberia. Um, Charlie was that. I believe that's what he was. You, you are born to be a shaman or you're not. And if he was in a tribal society, that's what he would have been. His speaking in tongues, his oracular uh, veiled way of communicating truths, all of that, and his connection with nature, his feeling that spirits came into him and spoke through him, which he sincerely believed and which I believe. But that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're a good person. And I think right. a lot of new age people think, oh, but he was a mean you know, murderous, etc. Yeah, but so are, shamans are used to do black magic in tribal society. They are experts in how to kill people through sorcery. And these are things Charlie was very interested in too, is using them, like he said many times, you know, I don't need a weapon, I do it with my mind. Um, so he, you know, people think I'm crazy to say, how could he be a shaman? And also, as I point out in the book, he was a shaman in potentia he never had the training he never you know it, it's a traditional thing you need to be trained but a lot of his problems in life i believe were because that's what he was and he never got to become that mm. right so yeah he had the spiritual gift like he had a musical gift and he, he frankly he squandered both of them in my opinion it's a tragedy he had wisdom. He had spiritual understanding on a very high level. But right. he had this other side of him, money and greed and crime and immediately gravitating to that and his music. I, and I've, you can hear me. I said it to him. I was drawn to your creative side, not your destructive side. And I never made any bones about that. And I never did get into his criminal pursuits, which he constantly tried to drag me into. 
as right. he did with everyone he knew. And did that happen on the ranch? Sure, I'll, I can see it. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. it did. I he tried to do it with me a hundred times. Yeah, and you know. that's yeah, yeah. And that, yeah. I mean, and when you say did he did he manipulate people to do things? It just came naturally. Like I described my first meeting with Newell Emmons. I hardly knew Charlie, right. and he's saying, you know go to channel five and tell new lemons this now a weak person who's looking for a father figure and a leader, which I'm not looking for would say, yes, Charlie, you know, and you listen to many of these conversations that people have with Charlie, you know, that he, you know, he's saying, you know, so the pyramids are built by Theodore Roosevelt. And I went down to the submarine uh, in 1922 and you motherfucker didn't even know about the whole uh, finances of what was going on in that particular situation, and that, and someone will say, "Yes, Charlie, yes, Charlie," <laughs> and that. But I would ask him, "Well, wait, what do you mean by yeah. that? Are you saying this? Are you saying that?" So I tried to understand what he was saying, and he would then, you know, like he would often say, "You people did this to me," and I'd say, "I well, I didn't do anything to you. Leave me <laughs> out of it." And he'd say, "Well." And then he'd go in another voice, like this was the person who was dictating to the Manson character. He'd say, no, man, I'm, I'm saying you people, like I'm, you are the world. But I'm, you know, like he would back off from that persona to explain it, if you gave him time to. Now, sure. very few people did that. Mo like his sycophants and his fans just, yes, Charlie, yes, Charlie. And they don't know what the hell he's saying or mm -hmm. care. And then his detractors are... Let's get back to the murders. When, when, why did you hypnotize these people to start a race war? <laughs> hey, so, yeah. so either way, but if you took your time with him and at, well, wait, what do you mean by that? Because you said here, this, and it doesn't quite, and he would take the time to explain it. Right. Okay. And he would often say, you know, I, to everyone, like, does that communicate to you? Do you know what I mean? Because he yeah. felt like he wasn't being understood and... Right. You know, so I tried to decipher what he was saying, but you had to ask him. Right. If yeah, you just let him ramble and rant, he would go on for 10 hours. And, you know, like one funny thing he said to me, which I've said before, he said, uh, you know, we've got a problem in communication. You keep trying to say something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking perfect. Um, okay. So we've, We've gone through a couple more of these uh, of these questions. You you went a little bit into because we we bounced back, but you went a little bit yeah. into Joel Rostow, yeah. switching gears again. And uh, Joel Rostow and Gino Massaro are two very important people in this that I didn't hear about until I really started looking into it. There are another mm -hmm. couple people left off the main thing. So can you? briefly explain who they are and what they have to do with this other than what you've said about him being a drug dealer and being ripped off by Tex. Right. Well, Joel Rostow was a, a low level mafia connected guy from Boston, which is interestingly where Linda Kasabian came from. I don't have any reason to think they had a connection though they certainly might have because they were mm -hmm. in the same world. They were both mm -hmm. dealing acid in Boston and in Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. like the Canadian connection, like you, mm -hmm. um, there, there's a Canadian connection to this crime. Ian Quarrier and the whole right. Canadian contingent of drug dealers bringing the MDA to um, Wojtek Frakowski. There's also a Boston thing of the Kasabians and Joel Rostow coming to LA, acid dealers coming to LA. So Joel Rostow was the crime partner of Gino Massaro, who right. was an, a, another much more deeply involved mob guy. Although Rostow had connections to various uh, so-called syndicates and families. He worked for several in New England, New Jersey, and a few others, and in New York City. And I'm not going to get into it, but the book gets into great detail on this mafia scam, huge thing of stealing valuables and money at JFK airport, which Joel Rostow was very much a part of. Mm -hmm. And thing, where he was found dead, coincidentally. Where, well, where he was beaten to death and left in, a, in the back of a car with blood pouring out of it that the cops found 
in his underwear with his head beaten in right okay. before the trial began. Wow. Yeah. Um, now, the most likely person to have killed him is his crime partner, Gino Massaro, who was in possession of Rostow's gun when the police came to interrogate him. He was never convicted. Now, to get into Gino Massaro, uh, very briefly, because that's a whole show in itself, as you well yeah, know yeah. and have probably handled, in Texas memoir, which is a transcription of the legendary and much hyped text tapes. Well, that, that book, Will You Die For Me? Uh, Reverend Hoekstra, this scammy Christian evangelist who tried to make a reputation by getting infamous uh, criminals to become born again Christians. He had access to the text tapes and in Will You Die For Me? Tex writes this casual comment that the families mafia vending machine connection is who Bernard, you know, theoretically was who he was fronting this money that was that, that he stole from Crow. That in other words, he was going to go buy this amount of weed for 2000 something bucks that he took stole from Crow and Kroner uh, and was going to pay our this mafia vending machine. Well, the best way to understand this, look at the Manson Mythos blog, Dennis La Calandra has done incredible, precise, detailed research proving that Gino Massaro was indeed, we knew he was connected to a vending machine operation from the FBI report, which has been common knowledge for quite some time. But if go to the Manson Mythos blog and you will see that Dennis has gone deeply into the history of this vending machine company, Discomat, which was a front for a major New England narcotics operation run by, by Patriarca, who was the head, uh, the feared head of the New England syndicate. And Massaro was on the board of that group. And Charlie, I mean, so you really got to look at this research. It's incredible mm -hmm. what it absolutely shows that Discomat, this vending machine operation, was part of a major narcotics operation. And if I haven't made myself clear enough, that's what this whole thing is about, is there was a major international drug dealing ring on the highest level, not just street criminals. The, what we saw at Cielo Drive was like the curtain opened for a second and you got a flash and you saw a little bit, but everything beyond it, it ties into Disco Matt, Gino Massaro. Joel Rostow and these right. major drug dealers. And one thing I want to point out about Massaro in the book, I just, there is, if, if anyone doubts that Tex Watson knew Gino Massaro, this is proof that they were in the same world. In 1968, there was a robbery exactly like what Tex did to Rostow and McCaffrey, exactly like what Tex did to Sebring and Fakowski, exactly like, you know, what, Texas M.O. Gino Massaro dressed up in a police uniform with several other criminal associates and, and broke into another criminal's apartment house and said, where's the stuff? Exactly like Tex did with Joel Rostow. And right. they were trying to rob cocaine and they were trying to avenge themselves on another burn. Too complicated to explain here. But this right. endless cycle of burns and drug deals Gino Massaro. People trying to get one over on each other. Right, yeah. right. And that's all that happened with Cielo. That's, that's right. what that was about. Um, Gino Massaro was shot almost fatally during this break-in. And someone in, who was in the house was a guy named Ivars Apenitis, which is an extremely unique name. I believe there's only one on the planet. <laughs> and Ivars Apenitis was later directly connected to Tex Watson's lawyers, Deloach and Walshen. And oh, if you don't know who those two people are, they showed up after Tex was arrested in McKinney, Texas. They showed up in Dallas and said, we are Tex Watson's lawyers and we're here to represent him. And the judge said, get the hell out of here. Tex said, I don't want to see these people. Well, they were later disbarred for major 
narcotics trafficking, pimping, running massage parlors that were whorehouses, uh, all kinds of crimes. They right. were very high level criminals and they knew Tex since 1968 and, right. and had worked with him. So here's the, the smoking gun. When Ivar's Apinidis, this guy who you will remember was involved in the break-in and shooting that Masaro was involved in, Ivar's Apinidis was arrested in the 70s for flying a plane filled with cocaine from South America, major drug dealing. This is not just Bernard Crow on the street corner. This right. is a major, very well-funded, sophisticated narcotics trafficking organization. Ivar Zapanidis was working with Walshen and Deloach. So that is a direct connection. And I called him. I tracked him down and I called him. And when I called him, he was immediately hostile to me. Although he didn't even know who it was. Immediately hostile. I said, as I often did to get into people's... To, because if you say the M word the phone's down immediately for the most right. part. Yeah. And if it isn't, it's probably a bullshit artist for the most people. Anyone who enthusiastically wants to come forward and tell you something is usually lying. Mm. It's the people who don't want to talk to you that you want to talk to. So right. I said, well, I'm, work I'm working on a book on the music industry in the late 60s, which is vaguely true, kind of. True. Right, sure, and, <laughs> there's, there's and, reference. Yeah, and he, he said, yeah, like he didn't believe me. And, uh, and I said, can I ask you some questions? Because I had seen an FBI, and when I said FBI, he cut me off at report. He said, I don't have anything to say to you. You know, don't, I have no, nothing to say to you. I said, can I, and I always try this. Can I ask yeah. you one question? And now he's even angrier. And he says, one. And I say, how well did you know Charles Watson and Gino Massaro? And he said, you ever call me again, you're dead and hung up on me. Jesus. So now if I was him, I'd say, you know, that was 50 something years ago. I, I really don't remember those names. Sorry. Right. But he was angry. I think nobody had mentioned this to him. And, and he is an absolute link between Tex Watson's criminal drug dealing lawyers who have a long history of drug dealing and Gino Massaro, which connects it to Rostow. And then we get into Horn Avenue. Which is exactly what I was going to say. There's another connection of people because Horn Avenue, with like you were saying, the apartment uh, that has to do with Lot Zapapa, it also has to do with Gino Massaro. And Joel and, Rostow. And Joel Rostow. If you want to just expand on that a little it's, bit and say what you know. About it's, in, it's in the book for pages. I have a chapter called Horn, you know, about horn and and i right. get back to it again and again it would it's it would be too detailed to get into here but let's put it this way joel rostow who delivered drugs to cielo drive to sebring the night of the murders who is the girlfriend i mean the, the boyfriend of charlene mccaffrey jc brings receptionist has a criminal operation going on at Horn Avenue. In another apartment, Bernard Crow, who Charlie shot and who Tex Watson ripped off at Rosina Croner's apartment on Franklin, is running another sophisticated criminal operation in the same building. And they're very similar. They're making fake IDs and, you know, uh, not blue collar crime, not drug dealing, but, you know, fake passports and this kind of thing. Fake right. credit cards, which is interesting because Charlie's commune survived on fake credit cards and credit card scams of every kind. Right. So you got two people that no one ever thought of being connected there. And as I explain in the book, on the day of the murders, Frakowski is asked by Sebring to take a young woman who supposedly is Sebring's last conquest, uh, Susan Peterson, to drop her off where? That very street, a very short street horn in, near Sunset Boulevard, which I used to go 
by a million times because the old sunset on Sunset Strip, the Tower Records, the legendary Tower Records was there. Okay. It's right there. It's an incredibly short street. Right. And it's around the go-go. It's around everywhere. It's, yeah. It's right in the center of everything that Charlie was involved with. So you've got, right. you've got Rostow and Crow running criminal operations on a very short street that Furkowski goes to drop off one of Sebring's girlfriend on the same street. And you got Diane Linkletter living in the house across the way. But, and you can look this up in the police reports, Bobby Jameson, uh, a singer-songwriter, a little bit like Charlie, he was considered to be, he's going to be the next big thing. And he had a bad temperament and really didn't get along with people. Mm -hmm. Bobby Jameson, who appeared, by the way, with in the film Mondo Hollywood that has Sebring and Beausoleil in it. And that's a whole other thing. How did Sebring and Beausoleil get into that movie? Mm -hmm. I found that right. out. Right. Um, you got this cluster of people. Diane Linkletter supposedly killed herself by jumping out of the window across the street from that same building where Crow and Rockstell are. But she's with Ed Durston, who was connect was believed by the police to be one of the suspects at Cielo Drive. And her boyfriend living in Horn Avenue was a guy named Harvey Dariff, who several people said, including the police who interviewed them, was delivering drugs to Cielo Drive that night. Do you fully conceive this tiny street? All of these people are connected on that one street. Right. Finally, uh, if that's not enough to be suspicious and make you think this is the network from which all of it came, which seems very likely to me, mm -hmm. um, you also have, why did Tex, and this is something, one of the major things Charlie corrected about my 2011 edition was I had based it on what I'd heard that they took, that they succeeded at CLO Drive to get a lot of drugs. Charlie was adamant that it failed in some way, I don't know why, and that what happened the next night was contingent on some failure. I, I can't define it more than that. Something went wrong. Right. They didn't get enough money. They didn't get enough drugs. And he said, now, I've said this commonly enough, I think people know that Charlie told me that he, he took money from the La Biancas. That was the yeah. purpose of that whole thing. Whatever other motives may be and whatever connections there are, which I get into all of that in the book, the ultimate goal was to rob them. And he took money to the straight Satans to pay the straight Satans off in Venice because they were extorting him about Beausoleil and Crow, which they knew about. Right. What he implied when I, well, okay, and I tried to get more details. And I, it makes me again wonder, what did he do when he went back? Did right. he look for drugs? Another thing I wonder, did he know there were films there that he took? That's completely speculative. I want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. But knowing Charlie, did he have other motives to go back alone or with one person? Because he often mentioned something uh, obsessively even. He mentioned acid in the LSD tabs in the refrigerator at Cielo Drive. Did he see them? Did he take them? You know, again, that's speculation. But right. the point here is he implied that whatever was taken from CLO was brought to somebody else, exactly as he had brought money and what he said valuables to the straight Satans. Mm -hmm. Well, where did Tex go? He didn't go right back to Spawn. He went to Sunset, to this gas station. Where is that gas station? It was at the end of Horn. So is that an incredible coincidence that all of these things on one day happened? Rakowski, Sebring's girlfriend. We've got places where Crow and Rostow and Linkletter and Dariff and Durston are all connected. And the piece de resistance, it's in the FBI report of Eugene Massaro. Where did he move? when he moved from Florida to California to that very apartment house on Horn. 
Yeah, so. it's incredible. That place is just a mystery wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in, like but, <laughs> crazy. But you know, it, it's never it's hardly been mentioned. Uh, if mm -hmm. you, if you're not an aficionado of the case, you wouldn't even know about it. But right. it's, it's suspicious beyond belief. Now, to why why is it connected? What was the connection? We don't know, and I don't pretend I know. But right. if Charlie robbed the La Biancas to pay back the straight Satans, is it possible that Tex went there to pay back Crow or Rostow? Right. Who he had had the, dealings with. Why did Crow never retaliate for nearly being killed? It is very mm -hmm. unusual in the underworld. Someone comes who you know who it is, you know where they live, they come and nearly kill you. Usually there are repercussions. Right, Why weren't sure. there? I'm only bringing up the idea. I don't claim to know, nor did Charlie even hint. He just said, whatever they took, they brought it to someone, and it actually didn't help them out too much. Therefore, right. the next night, which so was one th successful. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing, um, Danny, if you want to to chime in, the you said that there might have been something, they didn't get something or whatever, and now there was a shortage of drugs for some reason well that's right? another thing that definitely uh tex said i want it when he called sebring or Frakowski. i don't know who i've heard different i've heard so many stories about that i don't know if he called Frakowski or he called sebring i lean towards sebring to make an appointment i'm going to come over with this amount of money i want this i'm more and a lot of people were doing that that night this party that everyone was going to was dropping by to pick up drugs on a Friday night mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. That's what the party all these celebrities were going to was. There was no party. Uh, right. He made an arrangement, and part of it was, I want acid. And apparently, Rostow did not bring the LSD that was needed. Now, Charlie says there was acid in the refrigerator. So again, there are conflicting reports and no way do i claim to know which of those is true but that was that's what i've mostly heard is that there was an argument okay i, I want the acid and sebring said well we don't i don't have it and rostow apparently didn't have it and you were beginning with this a possibility that i have had raised and we can get into this was that the connection that joel rostow said i'll be back with the acid but he never came back was Rosemary LaBianca. That has been suggested and hinted at by four different people who are not connected with each other. I don't know if it's true, and I believe there are many other motives for the LaBianca thing, but it bears bringing up, and the people who claimed that that was what went on, in a roundabout way, Vern Plumley, who is one of these rather unknown, ordinary crooks, uh, AWOL, um, military veteran who was a, a thief and, you know, basically just an ordinary crook on the ranch, he absolutely claimed that there was a direct connection in the drug dealing of La Bianca, that the La Biancas and the Tates, as he called them, had some kind of drug betrayal. He claimed very early on that was what went on. I absolutely believe there is a connection between the two victims, that the victims knew each other in some way. Right. Absolutely believe that. And I believe the connection is Sebring and La Bianca. It seems to, I've explained this even today in the Abraxas Circle Facebook group, everything from many different angles points to people saying Sebring and La Bianca was the connection between these two crimes. Lino La Bianca. Right. So, the people who claim this, Susan Atkins told women that she was involved with in prison, two different ones, that there was an argument, Tex and Sebring, that had something to do with the betrayal of the La Biancas directly. Ian Quarrier, who is this drug dealer, very important to the case. We haven't really even talked about him, but he is yeah. crucial to the whole case. Um, claimed that he knew everyone involved. He told a lot of people in this brief period after the murders, before he went totally crazy and was locked up in the famous Bedlam 
insane asylum in England, that he knew everyone, that he knew all of them. He knew La Biancas, he obviously knew Roman and Sharon and Sebring. He was there at the house often. He was there the day of the murders and he was possibly there after the murder. So Quarrier is very important. He claimed Rosemary La Bianca. He knew her and he lived near her through a drug dealing connection. Um, that, yeah, so, you know, that these are all things that have to be, but, but I don't know because I think there are many other reasons and motives for the La Bianca thing. I don't necessarily know that it was about drugs particularly. It could have been likely that it could have been, but there are many yeah. other factors. Considering all the drug dealing things that were happening at the time and how much. Right, right. It would but make some an sense. important thing is that Gypsy claimed, and other people have too, that, and La Bianca's first wife, Alice, both confirm there was a break in at the La Bianca's the weekend before they were murdered. And they also were at Lake Isabella. Someone broke in then. That was immediately after the Beausoleil killing. The Cielo thing hadn't happened yet. So right. another possibility, they were already trying to get money to either, and there were all these chaotic plans, get a lawyer for Bobby, pay off the straight Satans. For some reason, they desperately needed money. So they were already targeting the La Biancas a weekend before the Cielo Drive murders. So that adds a whole other layer of mystery to the case. So right. Get into some of your questions, though. That's enough digression. <laughs> I, I was going to ask um, in regards to, well, two questions. The timeline, you've spoken about the timeline at Cielo Drive, and I was just wondering what you felt the series of events were that happened that night. And then also in the book, you um, referenced some interesting revelations about Steve and Parent. Can you talk about those? Um. It's, it's so complicated. I'd rather people read the book about it because the yeah. timeline, it's, you, have, you have to see the, it's like Rashomon, this movie, where you can look at it from different angles. Since two, okay, the first timeline I ever heard was Charlie said, and I forget, the, sometime in the 86, 87 period, there's a guy getting out of San Quentin He's been here for years. I want you to meet him. He will tell you some things I can't tell you. So I went to Northern California to meet this ex-con who was like central casting ex-con. Tattoos, buffed, uh, Aryan Brotherhood mustache, everything. Yeah. And very temperamental and seemingly ready to snap at a second. I'm sure he was back in San Quentin within the week. Very friendly, <laughs> very friendly and very respectful of Charlie. And if Charlie said, talk to me, he was very hospitable. I met him and he told me what he said Charlie told him was the timeline, right. which I explain in the book. Uh, I don't know if it's true. That's what Charlie felt was necessary to have this, have me go from LA to Northern California to meet a, a fellow inmate who he seemed to trust who said here's what it is and then i told charlie on the phone okay i met so and so and he said who and i said you know and i said i don't know who you mean and oh i said God. come on and, uh -huh. he, and and he oh i don't i don't know i don't know anyone named that and i <laughs> got the point and he did that kind of thing a few times right whatever he was doing mind games or who knows, it was important enough for him to do that, and he never mentioned that again. That was the first time I heard a timeline, which I explain in the book. So okay. I've heard so many different versions of it. I'm not complete. I would never say, I think there are huge factors we don't know. Right. I've even, I mean, I've heard so many credible reports from people on the fringes of it all. And I don't mention this in the book because I usually, if I don't have three different sources for something I don't have any reason to believe it to be true and I don't I even heard that they went over first got into an argument about something left and came back that very night possibly 
you know, but I, I can't prove that. I heard that they came over a little bit earlier, got into an argument and then went back. But I didn't, you know, so I've heard so many different explanations of the timeline. And as you will see in the book, one of them, which Charlie didn't deny. And usually there were points where he would say, this is wrong from the 2011 book. He said, this isn't right. It was this or that, or that's not right. Right. And one story I heard was that they left in a panic and that Abigail and Wojtek were not dead yet. And right. That they, Shit. And that they, and that they, they just panicked and assumed they were dead because they were so drugged and then came back and finished them off. That's right. another thing. Uh, that Sebring was not dead yet, that he was bleeding to death in the bushes and that they right. shot him later. And then that was the gunshot that one of the neighbors heard much later mm. in the middle wow. of the night. You know, the, there's hundreds of factors to be considered. And after everything I've heard, I can only report, here's what I heard. Here's yeah. But, what have you heard about undercover FBI agents the night of Cielo Drive and the lobby? Yeah, place? yes. This uh, a disgruntled FBI agent claimed that. I'll be he, right back. I'm sorry. I just heard something crazy outside. I'll be right okay. back. Okay. Everything's okay. all good. Keep going. <laughs> all right. That's how is anyone not going to think that's mysterious? Well, we'll never <laughs> we'll never see him again. That's for sure. That's about the worst timing in an interview I've ever seen. I think. You know what? Okay. It's that you can right. expect that for him. That's why right. I'm here, Nicholas. Right, right. Well, we won't admit that we know exactly what's going to happen, and we arranged it. But anyway, <laughs> we're 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 totally innocent of whatever may happen to Paul. So, <laughs> so um, oh, that's weird. Your phone wires are cut. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, where were we before? The FBI undercover. Yeah, the F undercover uh, FBI a disgruntled, FB FB a disgruntled FBI officer claimed to a source I believe to be reliable that a lot of what was covered up was not because of some sinister plot, but because the FBI were watching Sebring and Rostow and a sting operation was going to be done because of not the narcotics, but money laundering and something to do with this New York um, JFK airport theft thing and other things that Rostow was involved in that they were following these people. And, oh, they didn't get them. It was a close, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what happened? Just a quick interlude. Yeah. Two cats just <laughs> rammed into my door that were fighting. Right. I that's, see an outside. That's the way this thing outside, is. There's hair everywhere. I'm like, right. what is that? Right. This is the way it goes. Okay. Yeah. No, that see that now there is a perfect example. If people don't believe that this thing attracts uncanny <laughs> energy, it absolutely we if you talk about it long enough, you'd be calling up demons in a few minutes, you know. So it literally scared the shit out of me. <laughs> yeah, it's just all yeah. of a sudden. Well, that's that's a perfect bang. example. That's a perfect example of what I mentioned in the early part of the book, this element X. There yes. is something it isn't about secret societies or occult organizations. There is a metaphysical undercurrent to this thing that attracts mayhem and disorder of that kind. And the perfect timing of that, when we're talking about why did these people come to this house? Yeah. You know, it couldn't be Something better. Something goes so. crazy. And right. Yeah. Oh, right. Man. And there were 26 cats roaming around Cielo Drive, of course. That's another factor there were wild cats wandering around the property so oh that sounds like a dream yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dad, yeah. i believe yeah. that a, a lot some of them were candace bergens left over but i don't i i don't have a chapter about the cats of cielo drive oh, uh, Nicholas. <laughs> get in. that's, that's maybe, gonna be maybe i'll just just do else. the animals christopher the dog and <laughs> <laughs> the animals Chapper, of Chapper cielo Steen. drive <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give the book a four star rating instead of a five. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. So, anyway, oh, yeah, the claim from a disgruntled FBI agent was that a lot of what was covered up was because of sheer embarrassment that they were hanging around, parked down the street, listening to people that there was what that they were wired and they fell asleep on the job and these murders happened. And supposedly, well, the police say absolutely the labiancas were also under surveillance 
We don't know for what reason or by whom, but it's in the police report. Yep. And, you know, I believe a, a lot of what was covered up is not only to do with the protecting of celebrity reputations of sexuality and drug abuse and obviously clear connection to crime and an underworld, but also sheer embarrassment of various law enforcement people who were looking at Manson, were looking at Sebring. And, you know, the CIA contingent say Charlie was a CIA stooge who, who they let him get away with everything. Well, Sebring was getting away with everything. Frukowski was getting away with everything. All of these people were indulging in open and flagrant criminality on a constant basis. Nobody stopped them. So, right. you know, uh, but I think that's credible. I think it's credible that a lot of the cover-up has more to do with bureaucratic embarrassment at their incompetence at letting... Also, it would have blown this undercover operation if they got into it. Right. Is that Very how often. you feel Nixon got involved in the cover-up? I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I think that's very important. That is crucial. The president of the United States was clearly asked to intervene, to do what he did. Mm -hmm. And as I've said many times, and I quote it in the book, it's not just that he, a lawyer, a very shrewd lawyer who never made a move without thinking of the political consequences of what he was doing and saying, and a criminal you know, a, a, yeah. a very sophisticated criminal who was at a point where he is telling his henchmen in the White House to go commit a burglary of the Brookings Institute. Yep. He happens to bring up a year later, you know, and I've quoted it before. This is very important. He says, well, they were so worried about that Manson thing. Sometimes you know, I knew exactly what I was doing. Uh, sometimes you got to win a uh, uh, case in the press, like with mm -hmm. Alger Hiss, and that he's talking about a, a supposed Russian spy that he destroyed his reputation back in his earlier uh, red baiting days. So, it's it, how crucial is that that the president of the United States is even thinking about the Manson case in the midst of ordering the Watergate burglaries, the the Brookings right. Institute burglaries and it's on the secret tapes and it's it's publicly available right now chaos and cointel pro those things seeing as we're we're talking cia and stuff right now those were two things that were like uh cointel pro is fbi cia had chaos and it was both things to destabilize the left mm -hmm. now it's i mean this is the perfect thing set up on i would i would ladder. say also not only the left but the right and i have mm -hmm. seen in my own life with right-wing extremist groups people that i knew fbi sending infiltrators agent provocateur i've seen it firsthand and i know that they do that right and so do you think bugging that... people tracking them down encouraging violence to see mm -hmm. who will do it that yeah. all i think that happened with the weathermen and with a lot of left-wing groups as well. So do you think that with the way that this all went down, that that has anything to do with the murders or just that it was sort of a uh, happy little accident that all of a sudden this, this murder comes to light and the people that did it look like these hippies that, you know, they're trying to... Well, what are you asking specifically? Do I think that intelligence agencies engineered these murders to stop the 60s or stop the hippie movement? More just that do you, well, do you think that there was anybody in there who were provocateurs who were like, if they heard something, they were like, yeah, we should, we should do this. Or do you think that because we know that Nixon knew about it, he said we knew what we were doing with the. Well, I don't, I don't think Nixon it. knew about the Spawn Ranch or ever knew about. No, anything. I. I, I just I mean, mean about I, the case. I, I, well, Irving Kanarek, who mostly talked nonsense in the trial, right. mm -hmm. Charlie's defense lawyer, he says it right in the trial transcript. He says, I cannot prove it, but I believe that Evel Younger, this is a very controversial and brave thing to say at that moment, is yeah. who's responsible for Nixon interfering. He says it in the trial on the record, and I believe that's true. Right. Evel Younger was a very close friend of Ronald Reagan, the then governor, which mm -hmm. is a whole other level, the Reagan involvement. Right. Um, 
so Irving Kanarek said it openly in the trial. I believe Evel Younger, who was Vincent Bugliosi's boss, who was known among his colleagues and friends the way that lawyers behind Bugliosi's back called him the bug, mm -hmm. Younger was called evil Younger. Right. So, I mean, he was known to be corrupt and barbaric and destructive. And so I think then, you know, I don't, to, to make it quite, Simple. I don't believe the CIA or FBI or anyone planned the Cielo murders. This is putting the cart before the horse. Right. Like all politicians, as we see in the culture wars in the United States today, anything that happens is leaped upon by partisan political parties to make mm -hmm. their point. Yeah. So, of course, hippies, LSD, free love, dropping out of society leads to killing pregnant women. That's perfect for their propaganda. Did they make right. it happen? No, that's absolute yeah. nonsense. I think it's idiotic. You know, right. And it's, it's assuming that intelligence agencies have capabilities and a competence that they have proven they don't have. You know? Right, and that, how do you they, mean about they're, that? They're not, they're not, well, the CIA is not specter. You know, right. they've, they've, they've failed a lot. We know a lot of their secrets. They, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they didn't know the Soviet Union was falling apart until it did. But they can <laughs> control people's minds, and uh, it's just nonsense. I, I think that uh, the CIA connection, which I made clear in the 2011 edition, is with the Polish exiles, which makes perfect sense because during the Cold War, which people forget the Cold War was happening in 1969, tension right. between the Soviet Union and their satellite states and the NATO nations was very tense. Uh, Polish exiles are coming to California and the FBI is definitely looking at them. And the mm -hmm. CIA definitely talked to Jerzy Kaczynski, who is this writer who introduced Wojtek Frakowski to Abigail Folger in New York at his apartment. Jerzy Kaczynski, you can look up. Many people believe him to be deeply connected to the CIA as an asset. Vit Vitold K., Gene Gutowski. Another thing people are going to jump on in my book, Gene Gutowski was deeply involved with intelligence. And okay. I don't think it had anything to do with planning the crime. But one reason he was able to figure out what happened and who was where is he had State Department connections. And since the end of World War II, Roman Polanski's friend Gutowski was in, uh, um, brought in, recruited into the OSS and Army Intelligence because he could speak Polish, German, he could interrogate German officers, and he was called the operator because he was so skillful. Oh, interesting. People who believe in mind control and CIA, when they read how deeply connected Gutowski always was to intelligence are going to jump to wrong conclusions. But the, the, the CIA connections are with Fukowski, with Jerzy Kaczynski. With the, mm -hmm. Why would they not be? Of course, intelligence agencies are going to say these are a bunch of foreigners from a hostile communist nation. Are they double agents? Who are they working for? What are they doing? And right. when the daughter of a army intelligence officer ends up dead next to a Polish exile who has a very murky and confusing background story. He claimed to be involved in the communist leadership and his visa is not quite regular. The mm -hmm. FBI and CIA definitely thought, what is this? Is it a wet op? Is mm -hmm. it an intelligence? They found it wasn't, but they certainly right. looked into it. So, right. So there is a CIA connection, but it is totally explainable. It's during the Cold War, and you've got foreign nationals from a hostile communist nation, which is to be expected. Some of them would be double agents. That's why, and we've spoken about before, that it, it takes a real knowledge of the times, the yeah. 60s and what was going on and like well, what was that's, happening with the CIA. That's why I spend a lot of time in, in my book to set the times are mm -hmm. crucial. And I mean, one thing about the times I think is important to stress, as I've compared it, not a metaphor, it's an exact comparison. If you take the prohibition of alcohol in America 
that happened during the gangster period of Al Capone and that mm -hmm. crime wave. The prohibition of alcohol led to the mob moving in on alcohol distribution, and it led to a wave of murders and violence all across America. Right. Out of that came Sidney Korshak, who was an associate of Al Capone, you know, and he, and he moved to Hollywood and he took over Hollywood for a Chicago mob. He was the Chicago mob's man in Hollywood. Uh, right. What happened in 1969 started, and I explain this in this chapter, Controlled Substances, these were not the first hippie murders. It started in Haight-Ashbury in 1966 when the federal government outlawed the sale of LSD and many other psychedelic drugs. They immediately became attractive to organized crime. And right. organized crime swooped in the distribution. And people were killed very quickly after that happened. And I get into the Super Spade case and other very grotesque hippie murders in Haight-Ashbury that occurred when Charlie and the commune were there. Right. And again, I'm supposed to be this great Manson apologist. Charlie told me many times, hinted that he had something to do with Super Spade's death, with the death of this drug dealer. He hinted it to me, to Paul Krasner, to Ed Sanders. And he, in this um, writing he offered for the first Manson file, the black white bus, he describes a confrontation with a black drug dealer that he later told me was super spade. So you got to look into Haight Ashbury already had very bizarre psychedelic drug murders happening. Charlie and the commune leave and go to LA and then they happen again. And what is yep. that like? It's, it's exactly like prohibition outlaws alcohol, the mob moves in, people get killed. 1966, psychedelics are banned and outlawed. The syndicate moves in on these hippie drug dealers and there's a competition for a lot of money. When, once something's illegal, it's very lucrative. So the prohibition gangsters, you know, is what happened again when you, America's insanity of constantly trying to, with this Puritan effort to ban recreational drugs like they did with alcohol it leads to murder and that's what happened and i think that's something everybody misses about this right i think so too it's yeah. it shows a real down-to-earth um connection to the mob it, and also with all that stuff happening um law enforcement and how it dealt with with anything to do with the hippies in uh, Haight Ashbury, they were just leaving people to die in OD in the road. Like right. everything was not nice. It was a, it was an not, intense time. No, nor nor should it be romanticized in any way. It no. wasn't nice. It wasn't right. some utopia. It very quickly turned into Haight Ashbury turned into a center of rape, abuse, exploitation, and and drug deal burning. You know, and mm -hmm. it was reported at the time, but. Everyone remembers it through this utopian marijuana cloud of peace and love. Well, it wasn't like that. You know, it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. And Charlie brought the commune away from hate because it was dangerous for young women to be there. Right. And um, there was also so, a big biker presence there as well. So it, it brings oh, the all bike, these... The biker aspect of it is huge. This is not about how hippies turned evil. It's about hippies trusted bikers. You mm -hmm. could say the same with Mick Jagger thinking, oh, we need security for this concert. Well, okay, the Grateful Dead have used the Hell's Angels, we'll use them too. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of naivete on the part of these very young, inexperienced rock musicians and counterculture people getting involved mm -hmm. with, you know, biker gangs that are murderous. And they yeah. thought, well, they're, they're, they're wearing the costume of the counterculture, they must be like us. Right. To, to yeah. the, real his, the real history of the death of the 60s, this narrative that mostly conservatives tell to say, look at how evil hippies really were and look where it went. Without the straight Satans in the Charlie story, the murders mm -hmm. don't happen the way they happen. It's about the straight Satans extorting Charlie. It's about Danny DiCarlo and the straight Satans making the Beausoleil-Hinman conflict happen 
Mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened without De Carlo and the straight Satans pushing it to happen. Same with right. Altamont. That it's, it wasn't about hippies acting evil and crazy. That's a total misreporting. It's about bikers right. doing what bikers do and, and trusting bikers. So that's, you know, those two things are a very important part of it that are left out of the narrative. And it has right. nothing to do with cults. It has nothing to do with any metaphysical belief whatsoever. It has to do with organized crime. Bikers on drugs are violent and like to be violent. It's very simple. Right. And okay, so while we're on while we're on this sort of topic with the the mob and stuff, we've heard uh, you've mentioned in other interviews the connection of Manson to uh Alvin Karpis and Frankie Carbo. So we don't need to get too much into their relationship, but you found some interesting information about um, Frankie Carbo trying to hook Manson up with a job. Yeah. Uh, and I, I actually, today I'm going through some cassettes of my old conversations with Charlie. I found the first one and I can share it with you maybe later sure. in the future. Um, where he's describing, I, and I, I say to him in the conversation, I just listened to it today, coincidentally, and trying to transcribe these old cassettes to digital. He's saying, I said, so you knew, you knew that Frankie Carbo knew La Bianca? He said, yes. And I said, and, and uh, you owed La Bianca a favor. I mean, you owed Carbo a favor because he tried to get you a job. I'm mistaken. I just heard it, so I remember. I said... Mm -hmm. He tried to get you work in these San Francisco nightclubs. Charlie said, no, Baltimore. He tried to get me, a, he got me a job at the Trocadero nightclub in Baltimore. And then he explained what that was. And then I looked into it in great detail and found it was the center of the mob in Baltimore. Frankie Carbo, one of the most important mobsters in America, one of the most powerful syndicate kingpins, mm -hmm. went out of his way to get Charlie a job in Baltimore at the Trocadero. And I have, it's weird that you mention it because I found that particular conversation. And then I researched it and the FBI did a huge report on the Trocadero as a seething hotbed of prostitution and criminality. And you can see what the real job they were hiring Charlie for was not night manager, but glorified pimp, it looks like, because it was a strip club or adult entertainment club burlesque and the girls were made available after hours. So, right. It so seems to be kind now, of like three star, the Trocadero, the right. The well, the, the important sorts. thing about that, and Charlie said, I wish I had done that because he said, at least the mob pays you, not like the music industry. And he meant right. it. He, he wasn't being sarcumet. I wish I just, you know, he felt like the organized crime was more honest than the Melchers and the Wilsons. Um, right. So the important thing about that, if you know Charlie, some Frankie Carbo, an incredibly powerful person in the underworld, went out of his way for this nobody because he liked him. They, they became very close friends when they were in prison together. Mm -hmm. Did him this favor. Well, you owe Frankie Carbo a favor. Right. And, and he told me, I said, you're telling me, you know, you didn't know Lino La Bianca, but Carbo knew La Bianca. He said, yes. Right. Well, put put two and two together. Yeah. I need money. Who 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 could give me money right away? Who could pay me? Or where is money? And Frankie, I then found out Frankie Carbo was in prison in 1969, much later. And right. I asked Charlie, "Well, how did you? How do you commute? Did you write to Carbo? What he said? He knew a again tying to prostitution, a guy who knew Carbo." who ran a brothel in Nevada out in the desert, and he was Carbo's middleman on the outside, exactly like Charlie later had his middleman on the outside. And right. his implication was he got messages from this guy out in the Nevada desert from Carbo, but that is crucial. And a lot of things that happened in 1967 in Terminal Island, these favors, Phil Kaufman, I'll introduce you to Universal Studios. A lot of favors were given to Charlie, and I believe he called them in when he was desperate and needed money. But that is, I think, crucial, that, that Carbo 
did, and that's how Charlie was. He agreed to do Neil Emmons' book simply because he owed him a favor in the mm. underworld. So, right, it was a type of currency. What, yes, and so what favor did Carbo say to Charlie? You know, right. What? How? What? What? Well, how did he pay? How? You owe me one. As Charlie's whole life was about this. You owe me one. What mm -hmm. did he owe Carbo? Now, right. what is puzzling about that? And I, I don't know the answer to it. And I make it clear the Waverly thing is infinitely more mysterious than the Cielo. Mm -hmm. If Carbo knew La Bianca and Carbo apparently was owed money from this compulsive gambler, La Bianca, that's what Charlie implied. Uh, what a miraculous coincidence that Charlie happens to go to parties at the door next door right next door and that linda kasabian also a year before that goes to peyote parties with harold true and kaufman and people who met charlie in prison so that is baffling to me both are credible but what are the the odds seem impossible that you happen to be assigned a robbery or a hit at a house you already are going to often next door Right. So, so these, this is one of 25 contradictions. How do these stories fit together? In regards to the Waverly Drive murders, can you, because we see this brought up a bit and there seems to be a little um, difference of what people think it is, but what, can you explain what you think the little black book was and what well, was he, it? Well, he explained it. Charlie explained it. And I, I quote him in the book. He said, it has to do with all kinds of financial chicanery being run out of the governor's office. Who was the governor? Ronald Reagan. Who got Ronald Reagan into power? Sidney Korshak. Sidney Korshak, who knew Frankie Carbo, who knew Charles Barron, a mafia guy who Jay Sebring knew, who knew Frank Costello. Uh, he explained specifically. I mean, you can, we can find it. I quoted, I deliberately quoted. I explain in detail. Charlie mm -hmm. ex said exactly what was in the black book. Right. There's no mystery about it. Now, the, did he mean it? Did he mean it metaphorically? Did he mean it really? And then, another, you know, there's so many puzzles about this. Charlie didn't snitch about anything. And I asked him this. Why He's snitching about Frankie Carbo. But Carbo's dead. And then many, he implied that there were mob figures involved with the Cielo Drive thing. And when he was very old, I said, well, you, you're basically implicating your friend Frankie Carbo in the La Bianca thing. Why at this point can you not tell me who these mob figures were that you're saying had something to do with Cielo? But he would not. Right. Although I've pointed this out too, that when he said, when he did this on again, off again thing about wanting a lawyer to try his case again. And he did later. I said, why last time we tried this in the eighties, you didn't go through with it because you didn't want to tell someone what happened. Why now are you not? And I, we talked to many, many attorneys uh, at that time and some of them agreed to talk to him. And I said, why would you do it now? He said, because the old men that would have killed me then are dead and now I'm the old man. Well, that's right. a, if you know Charlie, he's saying the mobsters that who who would have had the power to kill him, and who would have been the old men, people right. like Carbo, people who were in their sixties in the nineteen sixties. You know, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. so I don't I don't claim to have answers to that. There are many contradictions to these things, but definitely Charlie owed a favor to Frankie Carbo, and that is at least one of the favors. Right. Okay. Now, we've talked about the true crime aspect. I just do want to make it clear. Again, the book covers, if you think it's all about true crime, as you know, it's not. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the, th the, the thing that I like about it is that it's all over the place because this topic in and of itself has opened my eyes to a whole bunch of different things. It's the spirituality, different types of music, different, different types of living. Um, the... Well, I mean, I think, I think what I got into as far as the cover up is not just about murders. It's no. also about the degree 
that Charlie was involved in the highest echelon of the California music industry. That was right. covered up. Mm -hmm. Melcher's lies are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's uh, incredible the audacity with which he presented an entirely false narrative that everyone in the Hollywood world knew was a lie. Right. And uh, there's so I, I many. Think, uh, the, and I get into Melcher's life a lot more than anyone has previously into his neuroses, into how his financial troubles is what I think led him to get involved with Tex Watson and Charlie in the first place. And of course, he, I believe he turned to crime to solve mm -hmm. his financial problems with the help of Watson. So right. that's a very important part. The music part, the mystical part, the revolutionary part, all mm -hmm. of that is equally important. So right. I understand people are mostly interested in these crimes, but I don't right. want to uh, give people the false impression. That's all that this book is about. No, and like we'd said before, I mean, we could do a, probably at least an hour and a half on every single chapter of this book, <laughs> right? Uh, in and right. of itself, because right. well, they that's have so that's why I it. wrote it, so you can just sit down and read it and not have to talk about it. So. Yeah, so there you go. I don't know the if there's book. anyone literate anymore left in the world that, for the most part, a meme or you know a, a minute video is about all they can handle. But this, it's exhaustively in there. You could take one sentence of my book and go further, research it, and that will open 20 other doors. Absolutely. Not yeah. that by any means do I feel it is definitive. And I, I did want to point this out. Like, it never ends. It will never right. end. The amount of information about this and different perspectives from different people never ends. And like I said in the first part of the interview, every time I went to Los Angeles in particular, people would come to me with very significant new information. And I'll just mention, like, I want to give people the idea of how much more there is to know about this. It is never going to be over, which is why we not only maintain the Sabraxis Circle Facebook group, which we opened after Facebook deleted uh, the Manson File Facebook group for no explanation for the most bizarre uh, abstract reasons, and why we have opened this new Manson file board, which is a permanent archive to not only as an augmentation to everything about the book, but that new information that will come out of the book, which, as you explained in your last episode, mm -hmm. your watchers can find it at Manson Mafia um, at creativeforum.com. That's a new board that we've opened. Because and we'll link in the description as well. Yeah, and that's where permanent, it's going to be a permanent archive of not just me, but many researchers who are working in this field, many people who know Charlie. I'm done with it. I'm done right. with this. I mean, it will, the information will keep coming to me and I will keep reporting it, but I'm not going to do any official project on it. But um, it's been so easy going the whole time. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think people know how easy going it's been. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, knowing Charlie brought me into the depths of madness that no one can even imagine. The, the things that have happened to me because of it. Uh, I haven't just sat on a computer and looked stuff up. I've been in the real world dealing with people. And, uh, you know, it's le it led very early on to very real police harassment attempts right. to frame me from the Los Angeles police because I knew Charlie. It led directly to my near murder when my ear was cut off. That wouldn't have happened. It isn't that he did it, but right. getting into his mandala, into his circle, led to that. The it, Yeah, it, it had not only hasn't been easy, it has been threatening and malevolent and right. i wouldn't recommend anybody do it either well when when i first got into it and started talking to you you definitely gave me the warning and said keep your eye well, on the door <laughs> right i've told i've told many people that i've told many journalists and interviewers who have all gone down the rabbit hole and i've known most of them most of them right. for the past 30 years and i've seen what's happened you know Right. And it's and it's not even people who are 
that close to it because we can we can attest to having crazy experiences having gotten into this yeah, and right. just the the weird energy surrounding it but yeah. i want to again mention the uh the uh, the new myth and reality uh forum because when we first started out and we were looking for information the myth and reality facebook page was huge for us there was mm-hmm. you could the you could type in anybody's name find out all the information that's that had been spoken about and then that when that was taken away it was right. ridiculous that was a huge well, that's that's why we years ago created this board as i've joked uh just in case place which is what the people yeah. on the ranch called this little lean to that they made as a hideaway right i, I knew i knew facebook was going to eventually arbitrarily ban it so we already set up another facebook group and this other and now we will create a permanent archive there which researchers can place you know very complicated material without mm-hmm. being censored and mm-hmm. in, at whatever length you want with photographs and it can be a permanent archive of the whole experience. And, and again, not just the crimes, every aspect of Charlie's life mm-hmm. and the lot, you know, and the peripheral people involved with him. Right. But getting back to this endless thing, like I wanted to point out, and I'll get into some of these other things that came to me in LA. Just so you, people understand, I don't even talk about half of what comes to me. You know, even with this huge book, it's still condensed to what I thought was absolutely essential. There may be things that are more important that I left out. I don't know. You know, there's there's so much. But just today, and this is a point I want to make, nobody knows exactly what happens with any of these incidents. We may have a rough idea and we could come to a consensus based on circumstantial evidence. But for instance, here's a minor incident is everybody knows that there was the legend that Sharon Tate was initiated into the witch cult of Alex Sanders on the set of Eye of the Devil, this movie that she was filming in 1965 in London when she was still involved with Sebring. And the the story is that, you know, that's why she was killed because she got involved in this witch cult. That was one of the many rumors in the early right after the murders happened, and there are cultists and conspiracy theorists that believe it to this day. Well, my point is, who knows, because everyone in the Polanski circle said that's bullshit. She was not interested in occultism at all. Uh, That was a publicity gimmick. They hired this Alex Sanders and his wife, Maxine, to make the movie seem more spooky and give it some credibility. It was, you know, and there's a picture of Sharon with these witches, you've probably seen it, mm-hmm. in, a, in a protective circle. So conspiracy mm-hmm. theorists think, oh, see, it's, you know, the Illuminati initiated her and they killed her because she knew too much about witchcraft. Right. Well, everyone in the Polanski world said, oh, no, that's laughable. And I believe them. They, they, and there's no proof that she was interested. So mm-hmm. today, through a completely roundabout, arbitrary way, I talked to someone who knows Maxine Sanders personally, And she told me directly that Maxine Sanders very credibly explained, we met Sharon Tate on the set. I didn't think much of her. She seemed, and this is very believable because it wasn't romanticized bullshit. She seemed like an empty, hollow person who had nothing but being attractive. A hollow person with no interest, just a vulnerable, beautiful girl with nothing inside. And she said that, she went away from the set for a moment and that Sharon came up to her and said this very specific quote, whispered to her, we are sisters now. And Maxine Sanders, the head of this witch group said, what? And it turned, she said that her husband claimed to have initiated her, must have been very brief, yeah. within, minute, within minutes, but <laughs> you know, that, that now as of yesterday, I would have said that's a bullshit story. There is no proof but there is a first-hand person telling a credible story not romanticizing it not making a big deal of it Mm -hmm. you know it's probably a casual thing but just to point out every aspect of this whole phenomenon you say one thing and then somebody else will come up and say well it's not exactly how i remember it i thought it was 
this. And it's I'm not easy afraid to get flipped on report, its head. Reports I've heard about the Hinman murder, I don't know what the hell. The, the, there could have been many other factors there. I can only report what I what seems that the circumstantial evidence supports. So just to point out, even did Sharon Tate have a mild interest in occultism or did she not? Even that is Schrodinger's cat. Could be, right. could not be. And the, so two other things I'll mention that are remarkable that came from going to Los Angeles. And this is as uncanny as the cats coming to your door, right when we're <laughs> talking about <laughs> yeah. strangers God. coming to your door. Um, in Los Angeles, I invited uh, someone that was in the Manson File group. She said, I have some things to tell you, like many people do, about this. And I said, okay, when I go to L.A., I'm giving this screening and lecture, I'll invite you. And I invited her to the screening. And we had had some correspondence. And me and Mike Brunner, after we appeared together, I interviewed him at the lecture on the 50th anniversary of the crimes, we went to the worst diner in the history of the United States, the only place open. And we were there in the middle of the night. And so this woman is who I invited was talking about connections that her family, which is connected to show business and the entertainment industry had to the case. And she said, Mike Brenner sitting, Mike Brenner, Charlie's son, in case people mm -hmm. don't know, sitting right next to me, and she says, my mother, who was the daughter of a movie star, and I'll get into this later, mm -hmm. was walking into Topanga Canyon one day and gave birth to a baby, to a hippie group that needed help. They didn't know what to do. A baby was born. And we said, well, why are you saying that? And then they said, well, in 1969, when she saw the picture of the guy who stuck his head out the window and said, hey, we need help. Do you know what to do with the baby? It was Charlie. So this girl's mother delivered Mike Brunner. Wow. Holy shit. Wow. That's incredible. Well, I think we had a little freeze. Oh, he that's, yeah. on that. See again. The cats are going to come to the, the door. Cats, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting. I'm jumpy right. now. <laughs> so, so what are the odds of that? And then I talked to her mother about a year later on the phone and she described all of it which I will describe in another way is definitely Charlie stuck his head out the window said do you know we were having a baby we don't know what to do this woman had just learned what to do by the way she oh was very God. young wow. she was like an 18 year old hippie she said sure I'll come in and she described it all and it's exactly the right place the right time what what are the odds of that possible? No. That's so unreal. Then, and then another thing that happened at the, the 2019 thing, there was the opportunity to bring the door from the Tate house, from the Cielo Drive, to the event. That was one thing. And then, out of the blue, and I can't mention this person's name, the possibility was, well, a... Uh, uh, very wealthy person who is a collector of odd artifacts introduced the possibility through a middleman, I can bring the murder car to the event. The actual car that went to Cielo and Waverly. And it right. exists and it is, exists, it's under protection. And that didn't happen because of certain paranoia, but uh, the owner basically said, well, can you, in that Manson world, I want to get rid of it. Can you find someone, can you be the middleman to find someone to sell it? So that, the authentic car that was at the center of this mystery and nightmare, you know, that, that appeared out of the blue in the same wow. time period. Wow. All Where these did it things, end up? Did oh, you, it's, you know? it's still, it's still available. It's still there. And, uh, you know, and the person does not want to be revealed who, who owns it, but they, they do want to get rid of it for, you know, I, I imagine bad vibes and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but, you know, these, I don't want now, it. Yeah, I bet Beckham so, will want it. So, but those are three examples of just stuff that comes to me. Right. I don't even. Wow, look that's for incredible. It. Yeah. Those are three of the most striking, but I mean, I can think of many. 
where I meet, I meet someone on the airplane. Oh, what do you, I'll, I'll give you one last example. Sure. And when I went to California to go to Charlie's Memorial, I was sitting with a girlfriend of mine in the back seat of an Uber that picked us up. And I mentioned the name Charlie. And this girl who I was with also knew Charlie, you know, on the phone from 1987, had talked to him. I said something casually. The Uber driver, a woman, says, Charlie Manson? There's no reason to say that. No reason right. to think it. I said, yeah. She said, for the, net, for the whole ride, she says, I went to school with um, Ruth Ann Morehouse. No, 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 I'm sorry. Not Ruth Ann Morehouse. Um, Lutzinger, sorry. Kitty oh, okay. Lutzinger. Kitty Lutzinger. I went to high school with Kitty Lutzinger. At that time, my dad took me to ride horses at the Spahn Ranch all the time. I knew Kitty Lutzinger very well. I got involved with a mafia guy who turned me into a prostitute in Las Vegas. Jesus. I got away from him and, got, and went to an insurance company run by a guy named DeSantis, who was related to Lino LaBianca, and that was a mob front. So within a half hour, she knew Kitty Lutzinger, who is the girl who snitched on the whole thing, Bobby Beausoleil's girlfriend, mm -hmm. went to school with her, described her already being a bit odd and bohemian and not a surprise that she would end up with that group. Mm -hmm. Spawn Ranch horse driving and mm -hmm. hired to, to escape from prostitution, got a legitimate job in Las Vegas with DeSantis, who is part of the Gateway supermarket chain ownership. And according to her, why would she tell me? And that was a mob front. She didn't right. know anything about the case. She just thought, this is weird. This guy knows Charlie Manson. And I had, so that was the person who drove me into LA. Wow. You know, I don't have yeah. to look for it. It, it comes to me. <laughs> and these will be things that like little things like this, it'll be, it'll be nice to, because you don't have to put out another book or anything like that. If you drop something like that on the uh, forum. Well, that's the forum, the forum will be for that. It. And I, and I will say to other people who are, who are, you know, equally competent and well-informed researchers, look into this, look into that. Right. And, and it needs fresh eyes. It needs new eyes. It needs people who look at it from other perspectives and have other sources of information. So, yeah. right. So it just, I think it's necessary to point out, and you may have seen it to a limited degree. Once mm -hmm. you open this door, it comes to you. And yeah. I mean, just, just today, you know, out of the blue, the Sharon Tate witch initiation is brought up. Right. No, there's all sorts of weird little like we could do a whole nother show on the synchronicities. Right. And e and even even with that, I'll just mention briefly that woman who yeah. told me it was connected to the Ankh, which is Jay Sebring's international corporate oh symbol. Uh. Yeah. Her name was Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> just keeps going again. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That's I mean, in this that now what that is I try to get into this in my book too, in the element X. Mm-hmm passage it's very hard to convey the weirdness of this thing to people who have not encountered it right and like you say yeah, we've we've seen certain things i was at work and i saw a black bus right after talking to you one day right i was i was born near chatsworth where a whole bunch of uh crime was going on right and chatsworth it, canada chatsworth yeah. in canada yeah not right. Ch not chatsworth yeah. there but and just weird things like that and once you see, like even people that I know who aren't into this, who just know about it on account of I've talked to them a little bit about it. As soon as I started talking to them about it, they would see his face in magazines, hear his name dropped in TV right. shows. Right. Just it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. It's like, it's like there's a glitch in the cosmos and it's to do with this. Yeah. And exactly. and where does it come from? Is it? Polanski, born in France, and bringing it, you know, wh where, who is the center of it? It's not just Charlie, it's everyone involved. And right. there is a parallel I think people don't see. You have in this whole epic, this whole saga, these two diminutive little guys 
very driven, very creative, artistic men whose doom brings them together from Cincinnati and from Paris together into this nightmare. And they both seem to be cursed in some way. Right. And wow. they, both, they both are cursed by inviting a friend to stay with them. Polanski meets Wojtek Frakowski in the 50s at a, at a, um, a party at the... A Polish friend of mine tried to teach me how to pronounce this name. Wutz is okay. it's spelled L-O-D-Z, but it's the film school that Polanski and Frakowski went to. Oh, okay. At a party uh, that was held for the students there, Polanski was put in guard of the letting people in. And this guy Wojtek comes, who everyone thinks is bad news. Don't let him in. He's trouble. He knows these, you know, ruffians and thugs. He's drunk. Don't let him in. He's fighting all the time. Polanski said, you can't come in. And Wojtek charmed him, said, let's have a beer. And Polanski went against his friends and let him into the party. Does it begin there in Wutz in, right. in the 50s with that mistake? And then Charlie, you know, meets this guy through Dennis Wilson. Hey, I'm in trouble. Can I stay at the ranch? Tex. Sure. Yep. So there are these parallels between these two diminutive guys that like young girls. And uh, very. there's a lot of similarities there, though probably people on both sides of the equation don't want to see that. Right. Right. Well, and another thing that you that um, kind of on the topic of the book on how everybody has the two sides to them, like you can look at Manson and be like, he's he's the dangerous dude. He did a lot of criminal things. He's a criminal. But at the same time, he also had a lot of philosophies that you would find in self-help books now. Then on the other side of things with Polanski, which I've done myself, has been like, well, that guy's, you know, underage girls and he got away with uh with molesting that girl and stuff mm -hmm. but he also brought polish immigrants over from the war-torn country and paid for them to stay in the states or sponsored them well, right he was he he didn't he, he knew frakowski was a freeloader and he said many negative things about him and that whole group of people i've talked to relatives of them they thought of oh, that frakowski's bad news and polanski said no he helped me Back in Poland, his father gave me money for this film. I'm going to help him move to Paris and America. I'm going to, and he tried to help him, but he, the guy was a total fuck up. He got him a job making scenery at, I think, Universal. And right. uh, he, could, he quit. You know, this wasn't good enough for him. So, yeah, his Charlie and Polanski's generosity, in a strange way, hospitality, is what bit them both. Right. So it's a much bigger story. And where does, where is this? Is it Melcher's story? You could argue that. Mm -hmm. Is it Dennis Wilson's story? Who, who is at the center of it? Right. Well, I think in the, in the Scanlon Murphy interview, Manson says this person was going for the music. This person was going for love a brother. This person was going for this. And I think that's very reflective of the fact that it's, it's a whole bunch of different things. It can't be put sure. in a, in sure. a in a little box because... well i think too i, I want to point out too about the love of brother thing mm -hmm. i've never said that of course that wasn't an aspect of what right. happened there's not and there was never any doubt in my mind when i even heard of the hinman thing when i was very young i thought well clearly they are copying this pseudo revolutionary graffiti they're right. copying it but I'm, it isn't, I don't know, people so simplify what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I never said that they didn't talk about Helter Skelter on the ranch. Mm -hmm. I didn't say Bugliosi invented it. I'm right. saying that wasn't the motive for the crimes. Right. He right. Took, they were talking about it and he cleverly said, okay, well, here's, let's make it the motive. But of course, right. they talked about race war. Of course, they didn't want to start one. They thought one was going to happen. But mm -hmm. I don't know. They, my ideas are very watered down and simplified when they reach the public. So, right. yes, Helter Skelter was real. It wasn't the reason these people died at all. Right. 
I think it's the, the half truths that make it that make it easy for these people to spin these these yarns because there's well, enough truth in it that if you look, yeah, there was helter skelter on the on the ranch. They were right, talking and, about and, it. And 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 idiot Krenwinkel might as I've said might as well put Spawn Ranch Chatsworth on the refrigerator because the police knew they had a little nightclub called Helter Skelter that they had come and raided and. You know, and I think that that was just some brain fart of hers. I don't think it was a diabolical plan. Right. She, idiot, was listening to Beatles records and they were talking about it. So she stuck it there. And that's right. what that helped to hang them because Jacobson and other people heard them talking. But it has, it's not the reason. Same with love of brother. And mm -hmm. I believe Susan Atkins told the truth once in her life. <laughs> right. It, it has to happen. And of course, that's the typical irony of this case. Some of the most truthful things have been said about the biggest from the biggest liars. Right. What, and what it's she's... tough to figure out who to listen to and what right. what to listen to. But but after everything I've researched and seen, I believe that that Sadie blurted out the truth at the moment of desperation when she feared, okay, I'm facing the death sentence now. When she was being mm -hmm. convicted at the trial, she said, Linda. We needed money to get Bobby a lawyer. And Linda said, these people burned us up in Beverly Hills for this new drug, MDA. Let's get the money from them. That's the right. truth. But right. yeah, it's not love of brother. And Charlie emphasized this to me. It was Sadie was terrified of going to prison. And she wanted to get money for Bobby to say, look, we're helping you. Don't snitch on me. We're, that was... He claimed it was her idea. So was there, yes, there was a, I don't think there was any of this sentimental love of brother. There was fear. He's going to snitch on us and we're going to end up in prison. Right. And so was that a factor? Of course. Was the, the And obviously the little pig on the door did not, that's clearly an afterthought mm. after, right. after this mess happened. They thought, well, let's throw that there too. Mm. But Clearly, the La Bianca, they're going way overboard to do, even though they hadn't even seen the Hinman crime scene. So let me make it clear. Yes, Helter Skelter is real. It wasn't the motive. Love right. of brother or let's do something Bobby-like was a part of it. But it was interior decoration, mm -hmm. misleading interior decoration. It had nothing to do with the motive, which was robbery, which is typical criminal motive that's it so right. I, want, I just need to make that clear because i'm sick of people saying that i don't think those things were factors they right were. right and that's that's really good and i'm really glad that you brought that up because that's that's huge and we do talk about and it's, the it's, half truths it's, a lot yeah it's they were killing no pun intended two birds with one stone right and yeah. and another thing that charlie said to a few other inmates and a lot of valuable information came to me from people who knew these people in prison tex and krenwinkel i have nothing on they never said anything to anyone that's amazing but true but several convicts who knew charlie told me he said who who will it be is expendables people who have broken their word people who are worthless he said right. that to these so he meant these people broke their word. They, they, and Charlie, in, you know, he was consistent in believing if you break your word in a criminal deal, you deserve to die. Right. And he yeah. had no remorse for these people's deaths. None. I can vouch for that. He never right. did because he believed, well, they broke their word. Right. Well, yeah. what did they break their word about? Even with Hinman in the Hinman trial, people ignore it. He, he said he was greasy. He was dealing bunk drugs. What's the big deal? He said it himself in right. 1971. The people act like Bobby made that up 10 years later. Charlie admitted it right away. Interesting. So, so he said this to other prisoners who would agree with him. Yeah, well, if someone breaks their word, you kill them. Uh, so the point was, yes, these were, these were expendable people. And that implies... In his view, the La Bianca somehow broke their word. Right. 
keeping in mind from what I've seen of Charlie, he could have been wrong because he thought everyone was breaking their word. Right. Yeah. He thought everyone was doing something. And I, I also have wondered, was there a mistake in identity? Is this, to was it, you know, who knows? Because I, knowing him and his temper and his jumping to conclusions, you know, may, maybe that's a justification. Right. Because he thought everybody was, he thought Grey Wolf and Star at some points, they're cheating me, they're ripping me off. They're, I don't think they were, you know, he would say that stuff to me and other people and he'd say it about everybody. So right. That's well, a factor. like you said about your phone call, he thought you hung up on him and the right. fucking right. world was over. If, if I didn't write to him and say, I, I heard everything you said, what are you talking about? Maybe he would, you know, he could have said, well, Shrek hung up on me. I'll right. go kill him, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, you know what to do. <laughs> right. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Right so, on. Yeah, so I can read back into history that kind of behavior. And I I think there is a lot of chaos and confusion and not, not logical decisions being made. Right. Any well, final questions? I mean, Danielle, do you have anything else you want to know about? This has been amazingly enlightening and we've hit a lot of different spots in the book it it jumped around so i wasn't able to point out as many spots in here as like to be like this was at this part of the book but right. it it hit all, all the spots we wanted to know about and there's so much more in this book than what we've talked about on here and yeah, i think we've, anybody we've, co who's... we've covered less than a tenth of, mm -hmm. of it yeah i think anybody who wants to know about Manson and wants to know about anything to do with it should be checking this book out because it is a, a 3D look at the whole situation and the, the man himself, his spirituality, uh, his music, um, the people he associated with, just everything. And there's like, we didn't, um, there's names that you won't recognize, but that are very important to the story itself and connections. And I just, yeah, I thank you so much for, for letting me read this book and have this, this textbook to, to learn advanced Mansonisms. Yeah. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. And I'm not, you know, I, as you see, most of the interviews I've been giving are not in the Manson community, which is a ridiculous word to call this lunatic right. asylum. Yeah. Um, in the Manson I, asylum. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, I have nothing really to say to that, you know, um, I'm trying to tell people in the, in the larger world, what this was about. So this is one of the few interviews I'm giving that is this specifically going to go in. I mean, though, I'm sure many people outside of the Manson sphere will see this. This mm -hmm. is one of the very few interviews I'm giving of that type. So, well, thank and you I, very and much. I, and, I, and I wanted to grant it to you. Well, I wanted to grant it to you because you have been sane. You have not been venomous and and filled with jealousy. No, well, not sane. I think. No, so yeah, was, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just saying you have been civil and you have been professional, and unfortunately, almost nobody else in this niche has. So that's why I agreed to talk to you. So I appreciate well, thank you that very too, much. and I think. I think many people appreciate an oasis of civility and sanity instead of the venomous, you know, seething lunatic asylum that you find in so many other places. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad thank it's you. coming across like that. We try very hard to, to, well, <laughs> to I'm, stay I'm sure, of course. I'm sure it takes a lot of medication and electroshock to keep it in control. <laughs> It feels like it. <laughs> it takes a lot of uh, me yelling at the two of them to stay. Yeah, right. To perfect. Right. That's right. So what, what, any final question to end on? Um, I have a thought? final question just to kind of wrap things up, I guess. So now that the Manson file will be coming out soon, are there any upcoming projects related to the book that you'll be doing? And are there other projects not related to the book that we should keep an eye out for in the future? Well, from my perspective, this, you know, the pandemic interrupted my life and every writer musician and creative person this book should have come out years ago right. uh, it should have it was ready a certain version of it was ready before charlie died we started the facebook page november 11th 
his final birthday, and then on the 11th and on the 19th, he died. That meant I had, okay, I've got to add his death. And then I, and I had to put him in the past tense because it was Charlie is, had to become Charlie was. And then I had to add his death and information about that. Well, that won't take long. Then Mike Brenner got in touch with me. And then there was this matter of the funeral and Zach Baggins, which you will notice I didn't get into at all, except no. I mentioned it in the briefest passing because it hasn't been resolved yet, still, after all this time. But I did research every aspect of that. And, you know, and I, I have this radio show, which I've referred to, which I did on the subject. So that delayed it. Well, okay, what's going to happen with this trial and this estate and the various personalities vying for commander of Manscam? And um, yes. that delayed it. So they should have been out in these different versions. I'm glad it didn't because then even more information came to me and came to me and came to me. But right. this is part of a larger, uh, in France, in Italy, in England, Germany, all of my books are being republished by various publishers. The Manson file is being printed in a French edition. There are other, it's being translated right now for editions Pansolf, a French company. There are other, and, and so all of my work, The Satanic Screen is coming out in Spanish, French, Italian, a new English version. Flowers from Hell is coming out in a new deluxe version. Um, so this is part of a larger project just to get all of my 20th century works out in a final revised updated edition. And it's, so it's part of a greater whole you know, for people interested in the Manson world, that's what they think I do. But that's only one aspect of what I do. And um, if you had asked me in 1989, will there be any more Manson projects? I would have said, hell no, never. So <laughs> no <way>. don't, <laughs> and, don't uh, do it. <laughs> yeah. So I hope not. But there, there are some tangential things that I am not the central organizer or creator of that I'm involved with that are of course certainly involved with it and some of them are quite interesting I can't really talk about them yet but they're not okay. they're not my project they're they're connected right. to other people and I'm helping or supervising and I will continue to do that mm -hmm. but I certainly am not going to do any main thing about this topic ever again and I'm happy to leave it to others and as I point out in the book there's many competent intelligent people who I who you know I hope I've left the path open for them to go further right well you've I helped us further understand and I'll bring Paul with me right, <laughs> yeah, that's right. drag me right. kicking and screaming across right. the finish line. and then and then of course too outside the literary world I have not recorded since March of 2021 when my last album came out so I'm going into the studio again soon and I hope Great. to dedicate myself again to music, which is what I was doing when I got in touch with Charlie in the first place. It was all about music. That's right. why I got in touch with him. That was what I was doing. That's what our bond and rapport was based on. So I definitely will uh, not be spending the rest of my life talking about what happened in 1969. Right. The two longest years. <laughs> like, just... Right, right. 33 <laughs> year long years <laughs> yeah oh man all right well thank thank you both for your hospitality and for your intelligent thank and you questions and for maintaining as i said a sane oasis in a world of insanity thank and you. uh yeah i wish you and your watchers all the best all right thank Any you blessings. very much nicholas my pleasure. And thank you all for watching. And remember to check out the new Manson Myth and Reality Forum for right. any of the new stuff coming right. and out, any new exactly. information. And that, and that is going to be a permanent archive of all of this that will be continually added to, that will be much more substantial than anything that can be done in a Facebook page or social media because it's not under the control of any corporation. Right. Okay. And that's awesome. And, and well, I, I should you. point out, too, that if you want to join that, that the administrator is always ready to help you join it and teach you how to uh, to function there. 
Okay. Absolutely. And we did, as mentioned earlier, we did a, uh, a kind of lesson video with, with Wiley, who was, who's the administrator there. And right. so if any of you want well, to. Well, that, that actually, uh, the, I, I want to say too, there's a team of people who have who helped me and who have made this happen. Uh, Merlin Nowak helped with the design of the book. My manager, Annie Barta, set up the infrastructure for how to sell it and how, how the internet works. Um, the, at the Manson file at nicholasschreck.world, there are people who are fielding any questions about it constantly. Um, Wiley, Manning, the new board, the people who helped me with social media. This, is, this has been a very much of a group effort. And, uh, you know, all those people were extremely helpful in making this happen. So, you know, nothing gets done alone. Right. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Big shout out to them and, right. and to you. Thank you very much again. And thank, thank you. you, everyone. We will catch you next time. Okay. And remember right. that arrangement we made about this part two. Yeah. You, <laughs> okay. I'm on it. Okay. <laughs> we'll Talk see to you, you soon. Bye-bye.